In this part of chapter 12, um, I would like to explain the topic of risk when applied to stock investment. Um, on this figure, we have several lines going up. Um, so imagine your great, 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 great grandfather or some distant relative um, invested $1 in 1925. And let's say that relative of yours had three more friends. So the four of them each invested one dollar. One bought however many shares of stock he could with one dollar of a small company, uh, small di different small companies. That's the green line. And so when one dollar was invested in 1925, it was more or less um, increasing in value over time as prices of um, shares of stock of small companies in that portfolio that was purchased were going up over time. The second person also invested one dollar but instead into shares of stock of large companies that's the orange line a little bit below the green one and then the other two invested um, in bonds one but government bonds that pay uh, make payments over a long term the blue line and the other one the uh, brown line the one that's below the other three is treasury bills also government bonds but short-term government bonds that pay the money back over um, several months and let's ignore the purple inflation line so just focus on the first four, the top four, green, orange, light blue, and brown. So we are comparing these four historical investments, how the money has been uh, changing when invested into each of these um, investments individually since 1925 until roughly 2013. 2013 is the last year. So this 88 year time period. And um, in the earlier slides, on the earlier slides in this chapter, uh, we saw how the fact that the small company stock line, the green line, is the steepest, it implies the highest return that was earned on average every year. The second highest average annual return was for the orange line, uh, the large company stocks, and so on. Now we want to focus on risk. Um, which of these four investments that we are considering has been by far the riskiest? Uh, the best way to look at it is to look at the jumps. What do the jumps mean? Sometimes you make a lot of money, then you lose a lot, right? Which one of these four lines is the jumpiest? Which one has the most up and down uh, changes along this trend? It's kind of obvious that the green line is the winner, or maybe I should say the loser, right? Because when we talk about risk, we mean something bad, right? Um, so it has been experiencing the most fluctuations or volatility or uh, variability. So volatility, variability, risk, um, uncertainty about what you get every year, it all means the same Thing. So the green line, small company stocks investment has been by far the riskiest. The second riskiest has been the large company stocks. So stocks in general are the riskiest investment, or at least have proved to be the riskiest historically. And bonds, government bonds are safer, lower risk, more certainty about how your money will be growing. In other words, what return you will be receiving every year. So not as jumpy, not as volatile. The, uh, from the bonds, the government bonds, the shortest term, the treasury bills, the brown line, is the safest one. So this is what we are uh, seeing when we just look at the historical data, at the returns that are already known to us for these different investments. And this is how these different investments compare to each other. So 
how would we calculate risk? How would we measure the amount of risk in different stock investments? Let's uh, forget about stocks and imagine we are, you know, somewhere fun like Las Vegas. Uh, imagine if there are two slot machines. You can play slot machine number one or you can play slot machine number two. We are going to answer the question, which of the two machines is better? <coughs> Let's say if you play machine number one, uh, these are the four possible outcomes, and they're equally likely. They're kind of randomly repeated, right? Over and over and over and over as you play, as you play the machine. You can win $100,000 or $75,010 or $25,010, or you can lose $200,000. If you instead play machine number two, you can either win $100 or win $30 or lose $5, or lose $105. So these are the four possible outcomes for the two machines. And they are randomly repeating, so we can say they are equally likely, right? So let's say, you know, you've been playing these two machines, first one, then the other. Which one has shown the most, m more risk? Which one has been riskier? Which one has been safer? First, if you um, do the right math, you would realize that it doesn't matter which machine you play if your only goal is making money. You actually end up with the same amount of money on average. How do we know that? Well, add the four possible numbers up and divide them by four. That's your average gain per game as you play it over and over and over. $5 if you play slot machine number one. If you do the same math, slot machine number two, uh, so you add up 100, 30, negative 5, negative 105, and divide that sum by 4, you get also $5. So it looks like it doesn't matter which machine you play if your own comparison is how much you make on average per game. But um, what about the risk? Are the two machines similar in how risky they are, how much risk they offer, how much uncertainty they, they offer to you? Well, you don't need to do the math to realize that machine number one is riskier because the numbers are so much apart, so far apart. You can win up to 100K, but you can lose 200K in one shot. Whereas slot machine number two is better because the four numbers are not that far apart. Apart from what? From the average. And that's how we um, measure the amount of risk. We want to calculate something that tells us how far on average from the average we would be if we play each machine. This is exactly what uh, the concept of the standard deviation does. So. Usually, we calculate the variance first and then the standard deviation, but both tell us exactly the same you know, information about the amount of risk. So, in other words, we want to calculate how far on average our four winnings separately for each slot machine are uh, away from the $5 average that we have just calculated. <coughs> Let's look at machine number one. Um, we calculate the distance from $5 uh, for each of the um, possible outcome. So 100,000 minus 5. And we want to add up those distances from the $5 average and, you know, find their average. The average distance from the $5 average. But if we don't add the power to, we're going to get zero because everything will cancel out. Um, when we win, we may be above the $5 average. When we lose, we will be below. And that's why the sum of all distances will always cancel out perfectly and we would get zero. In order to not get zero, we can use this trick by adding the second power, uh, squaring the distances from the average. <coughs> 
and that eliminates the whole you know plus sign being cancelled out by the minus sign for some of the terms. Um, another little detail that's important when we uh, look at historical um, variance calculation we don't divide by 4 but we divide by 4 minus 1. This is something they call the uh, degree of freedom in statistics. So stat um, the stat field is sort of where you would learn kind of the depth of this, um, um, you know, way of calculating the variance more accurately. So not by 4, but by 4 minus 1, which is 3, in other words. So we get this large number, that's the variance, and then we take the square root of that, which is in a way uh, removing that second power that we added, just so nothing gets cancelled out. So the square root of variance is the standard deviation, and we get $136,933. This means that if we keep playing um, sl the slot machine number one, we would be on average earning $5 per game, but the actual um, amounts of money we would be making or losing uh, would be $136,000. $933 either above or below the $5 average. So that's the average distance from the average. We can now do the same calculation for slot machine number two. Um, squared deviations from the mean added up divided by three. So not by four, but four minus one, which is three. That's the variance, the square root of that is the standard deviation, $85, which means we are winning on average $5, but um, the actual amounts we would be seeing are on average $85 above or below $5. So again, it's the average distance in either direction from the, from the mean. <coughs> this is how the standard deviation actually calculates the amount of risk. And so now we can compare the two machines sort of in the scientific way. We calculated the standard deviations. Which one is higher? Slot machine number one. That's the riskier machine. This is how we compare risk. And it's definitely more uh, relevant when we are not sure by simply looking at the numbers which one implies um, you know, higher distance from the average. In this example, it's pretty obvious, but when it's not, you have to calculate the standard deviation, which will tell you exactly where you see a higher amount of risk. <coughs> okay. Uh, now we apply exactly the same formula to what we are learning in this chapter. Stocks. Stocks and bonds, actually. Financial securities. Um... So variance and standard deviation, that's how we actually measure or calculate the amount of uh, volatility or how much change we see in the returns of our assets, stocks and bonds. And the higher the jumps, the higher the uncertainty regarding what you will get every year, and that would result in a higher variance and standard deviation. So more jumps, higher amount of risk. Okay, um, so historical variance, we calculate the squared deviation from the average, then we add all of them up and divide by how many we have added up, minus one, which is this general formula, variance or VAR of returns. Sigma squared is a common symbol for it, and again, R's are the returns. So R1 means return in year one. In our particular example, that's the return going from year 1925 to year 1926. R2 is going from 1926 investment value to 1927 investment value. We calculate the return in percent, that's R2. RT, in our case, that's for uh, going from 2012 to 2013, our last. 88th year in our uh, historical time period. 
and our bar everywhere is the same number that's the average return just the simple average for that entire 88 year time period once you find the variance you then take the square root of that and that gives the standard deviation which tells you um, how many percent above or below the historical average return um, you were on average in each year. Applying that formula to, let's say, large company stocks. So that's our, um, on our diagram, that's the second, the orange line, large company stocks, right? The second um, from the top. Um, so we use the information on um, the returns, which are in the textbook for each year. So 13.75% return in the first year, going from 1925 to 1926, and so on. So this covers 88 of those returns, 88 years. And then um, uh, for each, we subtract the historical average, which was um, calculated on one of the earlier slides, square, add them up, divide by, not by 88, but 88 minus 1. That's the variance. And then the square root of that is 20.2%. So 20.2% on average um, is the distance from the actual return from 12.1% return. When we do this math for each of our four investments, so small company, large company stocks, long-term, short-term government bonds. Um, then once we do the math, uh, we would get the following results. And um, um, the highest risk is where we see the highest deviation, 32.3% small company stocks. That was the line that lies above all other lines. That was the green one in our figure. And then the line that was the flattest, kind of at the very bottom, the US Treasury bills, sure enough, has the least amount of risk, which is seen in the smallest standard deviation, only 3.1%. <coughs> okay, so that's, um, the amount of risk for our uh, four uh, different financial investments of interest uh, based on 1925, uh, 2013 uh, time period. Now let's apply this calculation to a different example. And I will walk you through the steps you need to follow. Some calculators allow you to input the numbers and then uh, they calculate the standard deviation, the variance, you know, everything for you. But be careful, there are several versions of the variance, how it could be calculated, and we are learning a specific um, way of doing that. So let me walk you through the steps that follow our formula, our particular formula. Let's say we are given uh, four returns for four consecutive years. We want to see how much risk uh, is implied. So 15% return during year one, 9% return in year two, 6% return in year three, 12% return in year four. What we do first, first step, we calculate their average, simple average, which we also call the arithmetic average. We add them up, divide by four, and get 10.5. Then we can Mm, to help us with the remaining calculations, we can then copy and paste this result next to each return in our table, 10.5%. <clears throat> then step three, deviation from the average return, which means the distance. So actual minus average, 15 minus 10.5, 4.5 for the first year, negative 1.5 for the second year, negative 4.5 for the third year, ah, 1.5, negative 1.5 for the second year, negative 4.5 for the third year, and 1.5 for the fourth year. 
that's the four deviations um, you know how far the actual returns are away from the average <clears throat> then the next step step four is we square them so we take these four numbers and we add the second power that gets rid of any negative signs we have for some of them. Everything is now positive, these four positive numbers. What's the next thing we do? We add them up, and when we take the sum of the squared deviations from the average and divide by not four, but four minus one or three, we get what we call variance. And then the last step is square root of that, that's the standard deviation. The square root of 0 0.0015 is 0 0.03873, or 3.873%, which means uh, when you invested into such um, investment that produced these actual four returns for the four years, that tells us that on average, the return was 10.5% per year, but the actual returns were on average 3.873%, either above or below this average, 10.5% average, either above or below. So uh, in either direction, you know, um, this much away from the average. So these are essentially the steps we are following to find the standard deviation, which is the measure of risk. <clears throat> and then the next few slides kind of take us one step further. Now that we uh, hopefully understand what we mean by risk and how we calculate it, <clears throat> then we can um, say even more about the riskiness, the amount of the amounts of risk for our different investments. Uh, in this table, we have large company stocks, small company stocks. We also have treasury bills and long-term government bonds, the four that we were looking at a second ago. But the table has even a few more. Uh, average return for each, standard deviation, or the amount of risk for each. You might recognize some of these numbers that came up a few minutes ago. And in the last column, we have what is called frequency distribution for each investment. What do the frequency distributions show? Let's pick an example. For example, um, large company stocks, right? In our table, that's number one, the first row. Large company stocks. We are essentially l saying something like this. Let's say earning a return between 0% and 10% over one year. How many times did that occur? What's the frequency of earning that high return? Well, it occurred in 1947, in 1948, in 1956, in 1960, and so on. So we can count how many times it occurred, what the frequency was. And different returns occurred in different years. Some uh, returns were kind of more popular, like the tallest column is for the return between 20% and 30%. That's in one year. That's where we have the most years, right, in which it occurred. And so we kind of basically, you know, um, increase the height of the columns for the return which was more common and clearly something unusual like losing more than 40 percent of your money in one year that only occurred once in 1931 that's actually part of the financial um uh, like the great uh, depression financial crisis uh, in 1930s <clears throat> then other unusual returns for example very good returns earning between 50 percent and 60 percent in one year that occurred only two times. Okay, so that's what the frequency distribution tells us. That's how it's built. Now let's kind of simplify it. First, what does it look like? It looks like what we call the bell curve, right? 
kind of smoothly goes up and then goes down. That's um, what the normal distribution looks like. So normally um, there's this peak somewhere in the middle and then what's below the peak and what's above the peak is less common, has a lower occurrence or lower frequency and it's symmetric on both sides. That's the normal distribution. Okay, um, so this is an example still on large company stocks. Let's answer a few questions. Question number one. In the middle, right where we see this, you know, the peak, uh, we have a zero and then we have 12.1%. What is 12.1%? If you go back a couple of slides, that was nothing but the average return. Average over that uh, time period between 1925 and 2013. <clears throat> now, next to it, um, to the right, 32.3%. Above it, it says plus one sigma. Sigma is the notation we use for the standard deviation. So it means if you take the average and add one standard deviation, you get 32.3%. Does the math add up? Well, let's go back a couple of slides. 12.1 average plus standard, the standard deviation, 20.2, gives us what? 32.3, right? 32.3. We can instead subtract one standard deviation, which would give us negative 8.1%. We can also add or subtract two or even three standard deviations and we can even go beyond that. And we would kind of calculate the resulting percent uh, return for those. So that's the answer to question number one. Question number two. Um, there are three extra numbers under this bell curve. 68%, 95%, 99%. What does, for example, 95% show? It shows, it tells us that 95% of the time, the return um, has been between, um, so within two standard deviations. So between negative 28.3% and up to 52.5%, right? So when we're talking about our 88 year time period, 95% of the time, which is what? I don't know, maybe 86 out of 88 years, something like that, th the return fell in this range. And only in a couple of years, it was beyond that range. So much lower than negative 28.3% in one year or higher than 52.5% return in one year, right? <clears throat> Um, and 68%, for example, shows that 68% of the time, so two-thirds, roughly, out of our uh, 88 years, um, the return was within one standard deviation. So in this range, between um, losing 8.1% of the money in one year and gaining 32.3% of your money in one year, in this range, sort of the greenish, grayish shaded area. Question number three, uh, we have this pink shaded area on the left and on the right under the curve, kind of where the tails are, right? Two tails of this distribution. What do those two pink shaded areas mean? Well, what do we have uh, for the cutoffs? Uh, minus two sigma and plus two sigma, right? It means, then we also have 95%, uh, right? So 95% of the time we are within this range and 5% of the time, the remaining 5% of the time we are outside this range. So 5% of the time the return was below minus 28.3% or above 52.5% either below or above these two percentages, 5% of the time. That's question number three. Uh, we can also add and say something like um, 
so what does 99% mean? It means 99% of the time the return is within three standard deviations. So minus three sigma to plus three sigma. And the remaining 1% of the time, so one in a hundred years, right? The return is super high, above 72.7% in one year, or super low, losing more than 48.5% of your money in one year. <clears throat> and now question number four. Uh, in how many years, during 1925 to 2013, was the annual return above 52.5%? So this is 52.5%, right? Uh, it corresponds to 95% probability or chance of occurring, right? Or act actually occurs, since we are talking about the history, about the past. So, annual return above 52.5%. That's this pink shaded area on the right. And so 95% is within two sigmas. And what's beyond two sigmas on both left and right is the remaining 5%. And because the bell curve is symmetric, each of the uh, pink shaded areas must be the same um, area. So if you take the 5% that remains and divide by 2, we get 2.5%. So to answer question 4, 2.5% of the time over this 88 year time period, the return was above 52.5%. So what's 2.5% of 88 years? That's, I don't know, one or two years approximately, right? So that's how often it occurred. And actually, maybe we can go back here. Well, that's where we see, you know, um, in which years we had it. So these two years are our good candidates. Uh, maybe only in one of those, the return was above 52 and a half and one was just you know just barely didn't make the cut but we can see the answer right here okay so this is the end of the um, topic of risk in the financial markets